The Supreme Court blocked the Biden administration's vaccine or test rule for large employers Thursday, but the requirement will be allowed for certain health care workers. The ruling comes as President Biden tries to ramp up his strategy to battle the latest COVID surge. He announced the administration will double its purchase of at-home rapid tests for Americans. Meanwhile, the Omicron variant is driving cases and hospitalizations to record highs in the country. Nearly 64 million Americans have tested positive for the virus since the start of the pandemic. More than 846,000 have died. The rate of daily infections has more than doubled in the past two weeks. As Meg Oliver reports, many hospitals across the nation are now at their breaking points. We have new details about those rulings, and the news comes as President Biden announced new resources for hospitals facing staffing shortages like this one. And the administration will buy 500 million more at-home COVID-19 tests for Americans. Tonight, a blow to the Biden administration as COVID cases careen out of control across the U.S. The Supreme Court blocking the president's plan to require employees at large private companies to be vaccinated or test weekly for COVID. But the court is allowing the mandate for most health care workers. This comes as the president called in the military today to help overwhelmed hospitals in six states survive the surge. If you're unvaccinated, if they test positive, you are 17 times more likely to get hospitalized. As a result, they're crowding our hospitals, leaving little room for anyone else who might have a heart attack or an injury in an automobile accident. Today marked the highest seven-day average for hospitalizations since the pandemic began. And in New Jersey, hospitalizations are up more than 320 percent compared to this time last month. At University Hospital in Newark, more than 300 workers are out. While patients continue to stream in, nearly half are infected with COVID. 17 of them are on ventilators. How dire is your staffing shortage? It's extremely dire right now. It's really bad and uh, being transparent with the public, but I'm also being transparent with my staff. 23 military medics will arrive here next week to help out for a month. Risk of rationing care, the risk of losing even more hospital staff every day, all of that does keep me up at night. One out of every five hospitals has a critical staffing shortage nationwide, and six states report an ICU capacity of less than 10 percent. You've reached the breaking point. I really do think so. I think our nurses uh, who have been working uh, for, again, for weeks on end and our doctors and our support staff really uh, are, are at the limit. There is a glimmer of hope. Over the last four days here, Dr. El Nahal says cases have leveled off, but the severe staffing shortage could last several weeks, if not months. Jamie? Meg Oliver, thank you for that important report. I want to now bring in Dr. Christopher Colbert. He's the Assistant Program Director of Emergency Medicine Residency at the University of Illinois. Now, doctor, you know, you hear what we just heard in Meg's story about how there are so many staffing shortages right now. I know your city of Chicago also seeing a record breaking surge in cases and hospital administrations. How's your staff? How are you being impacted by all of this? Jamie, we are a small picture of a larger concern of low staffing issues, as well as beds that are really packing up in these ICUs and the ER. We're doing the best we can with moderating some of these concerns and mitigating the really bad effects of this increase that we're having both ends with the staffing shortage as well as the demand for beds. I think that's a really important point because people people keep hearing that Omicron is not as severe and so they're not necessarily thinking about the staffing shortages which can impact so many other pieces of the hospital if you are in a car accident or if you have a heart attack. Can you just explain to people the pressure you're under? To place things in a conversation that we can relate to, if the beds are not available, that means your family will wait in the lobby, in triage, for a bed to become available. So that means the abdominal pains, the children with fevers, the adults that have headaches, that ideally should receive management in the ED, there's just no beds available. And also that escalates as we have patients in the ER that do not have beds to go on the general medical floor and the ICU beds as well. And on top of all of that, you have staff shortages. You have patients who have limited nursing staff because the patients and the staff themselves are sick. 
And that's, you know, there's been a lot of criticism and confusion, really, surrounding the CDC's isolation guidelines. So I want to ask you, you know, I have some friends right now who they're five days into testing positive. They're still not feeling that great. They're not sure if they should go back to work or not. When is it safe to be able to be near someone who's had COVID-19? So there's two answers to that. Number one, if you don't feel comfortable or safe going to work, do not go to work. If you have any symptoms such as fever or cough in which you feel impact your work or put other people at risk, do not go to work. There are guidelines that are set in place for those individuals that are asymptomatic. And the thought behind this is that after five days, the transmissibility of your viral load is significantly low. Now, the reality of life in patients is that all patients are not the same. So it's important to realize that these are guidelines set by the CDC that for those individuals that are asymptomatic and after five days, they have the ability to return to work. And this is just a means of, again, this is a very dynamic process to ensure and maintain a balance between having staff, treating patients, and keeping both patients and staff healthy. I think there's some confusion, too. You know, we had heard about the 10-day rule before, and I have some friends who they've reached that 10 days. They're still testing positive. What do you have to say to them? That there's not a line you can draw in the sand and state that after seven days or six days, your antibodies will be negative. This is more a concern and being cognizant of symptoms. If you don't feel well, if you still have a fever, if you still have a cough, communicate with your primary care physician before returning to work. That's extremely important because ideally we don't want to amplify the spread of any concern by someone returning to work a little bit too soon. You know, I know some people who they're vaccinated, they were even boosted, they then got COVID over the holidays. They seem to almost be acting like they're now invincible, that they have all these antibodies or they have some type of immunity. What are you really seeing in terms of Omicron? Should we be concerned that this is so transmissible you could end up catching it again? This is extremely important, too, and a point that needs to be made is that defining Omicron as mild does not increase the caseloads that we're seeing in the emergency room across this country. Couple with that, with the patients. Patients are still coming to the emergency room with the symptoms of cough and fever and abdominal discomfort and even headache that are concerning enough to come to the hospital. Receiving the vaccine and receiving the booster significantly decrease any severity or decrease admission to a hospital, but it doesn't cure the concerns of having the virus. What's extremely important for those individuals who receive the vaccine and the booster to still adhere to recommendations to con con continue to wear the mask, to practice social distancing as well, and we can move forward with managing this as best we possibly can. Well, that's, I think a lot of us are doing that. I'm vaccinated and boosted, and I'm adhering to all of that. I think it's the people who are vaccinated, boosted, and they got COVID within the last month that now seem to be thinking that they're okay. Should they go under that assumption? It's not good to go to the assumption. It's great to go under the assumption that vaccinations and boosters significantly enhance immunity, but not that you are in a category in which you can put caution to the wind. Again, this is a topic of shared responsibility. If we all adhere to recommendations, we can honestly move forward as a community to a better place and to this new normal. You know, I, before I let you go, we mentioned um, at the top of this broadcast that the Supreme Court has now blocked the Biden administration's rule on vaccines and testing for large companies, but has kept the rule in healthcare settings. Still, masks are an essential tool for avoiding COVID-19, but can you remind us which ones are really the best at protection? Because this also keeps changing for people. The best masks to wear are those of the N95. Remember, high occupancy, high risk. So what you want to do is decrease the transmissibility as best we possibly can. That's why the recommendation is the N95. Now, the 95 specifically indicates that 95% effectiveness in filtering anything that comes in or out. After that, it is the surgical masks. And it's our recommendation to totally get rid of the cloth mask, to use a mm. surgical mask and to use the N95s. That's I said, no more cute masks. You gotta you gotta wear the real deal, right? Dr. Christopher Colbert. Thank you. The real deal. Thank you so much for being with us. Such important information. We really appreciate you being here.